you, Father in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for all of our blessings. I pray, Father, for your presence with us as we come together, Lord, as a, as a little army, as an a army in training, Lord, to study these things, to prepare uh, for what is coming. I pray, Lord, that you will send your Holy Spirit to open our minds and that we might, um, each one of us, uh, understand your truths. Father, that um, problems of, of language, problems where I explain, um, perhaps poorly, Lord, that you might uh, work with us still, that we might come to a common understanding, Lord, of, of prophecy. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello again. Good morning again. As I promised yesterday, uh, last night, um, the line that we covered yesterday, the line of history, has been rewritten um, more neatly and um, in one piece. I just want to step us through it, remind us of this history. So we began with Acts chapter 27 and picked up the number 273 that brought us to 273 BC as a way mark between Midnight Cry and Sunday Law. Then we understood that what made 273 BC significant was this alliance between Egypt and Rome and that this alliance was brought about by a war between the north and the south so that we can understand the way mark of midnight cry or panium before 273 BC is when the north or Rome in this case defeats the south or Tarentum and Pyrrhus. That occurred in 275 BC. Once we have identified Pyrrhus as the king of the south we could have just traced his war with Rome and understood this Pyrrhic, what's known as the Pyrrhic War. We could have stopped there and just traced his war with Rome. But when we go farther back, if we go back to the very beginning of, the, of, the, um, of Pyrrhus, of the King of the South, we find that there is this first Alpha history. That first of all, he has his campaigns in Macedonia that take place before the Pyrrhic War with Rome. So we went back to the beginning of Pyrrhus's involvement in world affairs um, instead of picking it up at this midpoint where he um, sails to Italy. We saw that in 273 BC Alexander the Great died and Daniel 8 uh, gives us the story of Greece where the, the um, the, most, the, the significant horn Alexander was broken at the height of the Greek Empire's power and when, they bro when he is broken, when he dies, a relatively young man, four generals come up in his place. But those generals, those four generals are not in place in those four winds of heaven, north, south, east and west. They aren't placed there as the final four generals until 22 years after Alexander the Great's death. We understand that there's four Diadochi wars, four wars where they fight over the empire of Alexander before those four take their positions. This is the fourth, the history of the fourth Diadochi war. And we know that when we come to a reform line, we are constantly reminded of the number four as uh, at the time of the end we enter into the fourth generation. So the symbol of the number four is usually found um, in this history. The fourth Diadochi War began when Demetrius freed Athens from a dictator. At this beginning you can mark a ten year period of time. Cassander had placed a dictator in Athens in 317 BC and in 307, 10 years later, Demetrius frees Athens. They begin to deify him. He, he, they are glad to be freed from this dictator. Then we find 
Pyrrhus enter the fourth Diadochi War. He goes into an alliance with Demetrius. Those, this fourth Diadochi War culminates at the Battle of Ipsus in 301 BC. This is where our, our four generals are um, coming against Antigonus. Ptolemy turns back home. So what you find when it comes to the actual battle is you have three allies who are known as the Allied Forces. Three allies coming against Antigonus and Demetrius. Antigonus is backed by Pyrrhus who fights in this war as a general on behalf of um, Antigonus and Demetrius. In this battle Antigonus is killed. Uh, Demetrius flees. Demetrius flees with um, his part of the army and returns to his own, his own, um, his own lands. He still had a significant amount of power. What decided this battle was Seleucus' war elephants. The fact he brought between 300 and 500 war elephants with him on his return from the east and that he was able to cut Antigonus off from his own army. A few years after the Battle of Ipsus, Cassander dies. So we had our four generals in 301 really fulfilling Daniel chapter 8 where you had Cassander in Macedonia in the west, um, Seleucus in the east with Babylon, and then in the north Lysimachus, and in the south Ptolemy. I think that's correct, how they were laid out. Cassander died a few years after the Battle of Ipsus, so Daniel 8, those four horns, only last for about four years. Cassander dies and in his place Demetrius takes over Macedonia. But we, we discussed the, the politics after Cassander died with his sons, how Pyrrhus became involved in helping establish one of the sons over his brother. So out of that, um, out of the politics of that situation, Pyrrhus also received a portion of Macedonia. What you see is a division of territory between the two former allies between Pyrrhus and Demetrius. So Pyrrhus received some, but Demetrius received um, vastly more. Then it is Demetrius that is... Um, then this relationship continues to sour, partly because of this division of territory, and Pyrrhus engages in a campaign against Demetrius. He invades Thessaly. This is where you start to see their alliance break down. They conclude peace. Demetrius drives him back to Epirus. Shortly after, in, a, in um, one, two years' time, Demetrius seeks revenge and he marches through Epirus, ravaging the country. Epirus is unable to defend his country. Pyrrhus comes to terms with Demetrius again and they form some kind of armistice peace treaty. In this time, after Demetrius concludes peace with Pyrrhus, he begins a huge military build-up. Huge military preparation, re-establishing the empire that his father had had. You know that there was, uh, a, he was building a fleet of about 500 warships and a coalition army of approximately about 100,000 men. This, form, this creates tension. These other three generals, remembering the behaviour of Demetrius's father, are nervous to see the son continue in the same warlike path, an antagonistic path. So what they do is they come back into alliance. The three then form again, the three allies, and they ask Pyrrhus to join them against Demetrius. So these three allies join with Pyrrhus. Now um, he's fighting with them, and it's Lysimachus from the east, 
and Pyrrhus from the west that march against Demetrius. No battle is fought. Demetrius has um, such internal problems with his own men due to his own behaviour, not paying them well, not treating them well, not treating his subjects well. Um, he was uh, had earned very little respect by his people, um, partly because of how he deified himself and partly because his, uh, of his uh, homosexual behaviour that was also um, abusive. He'd lost a lot of respect and when it came to this um, these Pyrrhus and Lysimachus marching on him, this huge army that he'd built up abandoned him and his army either joined Lysimachus or joined Pyrrhus as did all the cities of Macedonia. So now Macedonia is split between east and west, half joined with Pyrrhus, uh, half joined with Lysimachus and half with Pyrrhus. This sparks a cold war. Lysimachus is unhappy with only receiving the east of Macedonia. He wants the entirety of the territory. So what he does, instead of facing Pyrrhus in battle and conquering the rest of Macedonia as you would expect, he, he shows a different mode of warfare. And what he does is through cutting off Pyrrhus's supply chain, his access to his, um, to his supplies, um, food and money, those things, he isolates Pyrrhus. And the other thing he does is uh, subterfuge. Essentially what he does is he undermines Pyrrhus um, in, the, in this area that had given themselves over to him. Pyrrhus's kingdom isn't Macedonia, it's over here, it's Epirus. And over in Epirus they're quite happy having Pyrrhus as king, he's one of their own. But over here in these countries Lysimachus says, why are you having this king over here rule over you? And little bit by little bit he undermines Pyrrhus in their eyes until they turn on him, until it's no longer safe for Pyrrhus to rule them. And instead of fighting for them, he returns to his country of Epirus. That was in 285 BC. That's really where you see a change in scene. Over in Italy, this, um, there's internal strife in the cities between the aristocrats and the democrats. There's two parties in those Greek cities. One for, um, to, to be of a financial benefit, the aristocrats with their trade, they want to become an ally of Rome and they want to come under Rome's protection. They are not strong enough to protect themselves from some of the, the hordes that are invading. So they, ask, they want to ask Rome to protect them. But then the Democrats, they are loyal Greeks. They want to stay uh, under, the, under the control of Tarentum because they're family. Tarentum is also Greek. They don't trust this up-and-coming Roman Empire. It's the aristocrats that win in that, in that political battle and the aristocrats then send messages to Rome asking Rome to come and protect them. They first, they first make that choice in 285 and they come under Rome. But they ask for Rome's protection again in 282 BC. And it's in the, the second time they ask in 282 that... Whoop, it's the second time that they ask for Rome's protection in 282 that Rome responds. And Rome marches on uh, down to Thury, places a garrison and takes, uh, under the appearance of protection, you know, it's really that idea, this country needs our protection, that Rome was able to really um, extend their empire into, into the south and into the Thury. Uh, it's, it's this idea, this excuse that we have to protect this country. And then they place garrisons in Thury. This angers Tarentum, 
So what they do is they attack Thuri and they force Thuri to come under the, back under their control. It's not clear what happened after that, but it's believed Thuri then just became completely dependent on Rome's protection after Tarentum had left. Rome and Tarentum then declare war. This was an act of war. And Tarentum, not strong enough to fight Rome themselves, ask Pyrrhus to come and fight on their behalf. Pyrrhus arrives in Tarentum in 280 BC and begins military preparation. He's not yet ready to engage in war with Rome. His army is scattered, they haven't come together, he hasn't finished war preparation. But Rome pushes and the war is forced on him. So they fight the first battle at the, um, near the town of Heraclea, between Heraclea and Pandosia in 280 BC. And Pyrrhus wins, and why did Pyrrhus win? He brought with him 20 war elephants. And it's those war elephants, a new mode of warfare that Rome had not yet encountered, that gives Pyrrhus the victory. Pyrrhus wants to continue this war. He marches up to Rome. He's ready to take the city. But winter comes and he's forced to um, with, withdraw and wait out winter. Over winter, Rome is preparing. And Rome prepares 300 anti-elephant carts that we described as these chariots with a, with a spear and with flamethrowers. They prepare for this second battle in the spring, the Battle of Asculum. Again, Pyrrhus wins and those 20 war elephants just break up the carts. This is a battle twice the size of the first. Pyrrhus then travels to Sicily. He's lost too many men and he needs to rebuild. He has this grand plan of taking Sicily and then Carthage coming back around and taking all. And to build up that huge military program, he becomes somewhat of a dictator, more of a dictator than he had shown himself to be before. To fund it, he desecrates a temple, but he loses that wealth when the, when the ships carrying those treasures are wrecked. Forced out of Sicily, when Rome is again uh, marching south, he returns back to uh, back to Italy and he fights Rome one last time at the Battle of Beneventum. This time he, his elephants charge but they are turned back, believed to be by the cries of an injured calf. The elephants turn back, led by that calf's mother, and overrun the army, Pyrrhus's own army. So he is defeated in this battle of Beneventum by his own army, by, but sorry, by his own elephants. Beneventum, the meaning of the name Beneventum means good event. It used to mean, at the time of this battle, it was called Maleventum, bad event. And the Romans became very suspicious of that name. They didn't like the word Maleventum. They thought it was some type of bad omen. So some years after this battle was fought, they changed the name from Maleventum to Beneventum, from bad event to good event. And we looked into what Beneventum meant when it came to um, spiritualism. Pyrrhus flees, it's the battle, the Pyrrhic war is over. But as we saw later on, Tarentum held, was holding out under siege and Pyrrhus had not yet died. There was still a work to be done. But still the south has fallen and the world recognises that. Egypt, particularly in 273 BC, taking us back to where we began, recognises um, the power of Rome. As we explained, um, Ptolemy, Ptolemy knew Pyrrhus. Before Pyrrhus became king, before he ever joined an alliance with Demetrius, Pyrrhus had set, spent some of his years of youth in the court of Ptolemy in Egypt being trained as a general so he was well acquainted with the Ptolemies more than more than most of the, more than any of the other generals so when Ptolemy the second Philadelphus a later Ptolemy sees Pyrrhus defeated he knows who Rome has defeated in 272 BC Rome returns to Egypt we see the symbol of uh, the maximum flood 
in the in the name of the chief Roman politician who led that delegation. Tarentum falls in 272, showing that Rome now has complete control over all of the south, um, complete control over the entire peninsula of Italy, and Pyrrhus dies 46 years of age in the streets of Argos. And we understood Argos meaning bright white in the context of a field ready for harvest. That is our revision and what we've covered is the beginning of Pyrrhus' involvement in world affairs all the way up to his death. This is the life, the political life story of the King of the South. Now I want to look into who the King of the South is. So we've traced the life of Pyrrhus, not from his birth, but from his involvement in world affairs. I want to note that, not from when he's born, but when he becomes involved in world affairs. We've seen it comes in two parts, Alpha and Omega, first Macedonia, and then the Pyrrhic War in Italy. One thing we should mention, Pyrrhus, what does his name mean? We know names have significance. His name means flame red. Flame colored, the, the, the red color of flame. What does the color red, what has it been a symbol of the color red? Danger, blood. And it's really using um, that context of blood that formed, that um, made the Jacobins in the French Revolution take it as their colour. It became the symbolic colour of the French Revolution. Then the colour red was seen in 1848 as the European revolutions occurred, revolutions in Germany. Though that French revolutionary spirit spread across, uh, it spread across Europe. And finally, it came up again in the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1917. If you've seen photos of a, the, the parades um, during the time of the Soviet Union, or where they, um, I can't remember the word, where they have the military parades and they march um, through the streets, all of their banners and their weapons and their soldiers marching, it's just a sea of red. It was the colour of the flag of the Soviet Union. It's just this red box with the sickle. The reason they chose the colour red was that it was meant to symbolise the blood of the workers and their communist uprising. If you follow the history of Epirus, one thing we need to understand is how we can use Pyrrhus as a symbol. Turn with me to Daniel 2, chapter 37. Daniel 2, 37. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Daniel 2.37 Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar interpreting the statue says thou O king art a king of kings for the God of heaven hath given their kingdom power and strength and glory um, and verse 38 and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So that head of gold, what does it symbolize? Babylon. But what else does it symbolize? Nebuchadnezzar. It's not just the kingdom, it's also the king. So when you look at that head of gold, in one sense it's Babylon, but you can also make the application 
that it's Nebuchadnezzar himself as a king. So when we consider the king of the south, who is Pyrrhus? He can be both the king of the, the south, the country of the south, he can also represent a particular leader of that country. And then when we consider the nation of Epirus, it's also the king of the south. And when we consider Tarentum, it's also the king of the south. A king and a kingdom are interchangeable symbols. So if we take Epirus, the country of Epirus, as being the king of the south in the sense of the kingdom, what we want to do is trace its history. Um, in a straight line, if we can. <laughs> so, we're going to back, go back to its beginnings, the beginning of Epirus. The first king of Epirus was Admetus. The first that we know of. Before Admetus, it goes into the mythological where they were saying that there was a god and he established a kingdom, etc. The first known real king that we know of is Admetus. That would be around 500 BC. The 10th king from Admetus, if you trace them from the 1st to the 10th, is our King Pyrrhus. He's the 10th and the by far the most famous king of, of Epirus. He reigned as king from 307 to 302 BC, but in 302 there was some political um, issues inside Epirus. He was still very young and very weak. And in 302 BC, in a typical, as you would imagine, how a story would go, not much has changed in a few thousand years. Being a young man, he went to a friend's birthday party. But that birthday party took him outside of his nation of Epirus over to a neighbouring kingdom. And what happened is a rival took the throne from him while he was away attending this party. That rival was Neoptolemus II. Neoptolemus II took the throne of Epirus. What Pyrrhus did, this is, that was when he went to the courts of Ptolemy. He uh, established himself, made himself stronger, and then Ptolemy helped him regain his throne. He marched back into Epirus, and what he did was he persuaded Neoptolemus II to co-rule. So Neoptolemus II and Pyrrhus co-ruled. You had two kings at the same time. Over the course of time, he had Neoptolemus killed and he returned as the sole and only king again of Epirus. If you trace the kings following him, you have seven more leaders before the nation of Epirus is ruled by the Epirate League. A league of tribes or of nation states. So Pyrrhus is the king of the south. In this case, who is the king of the south? Russia. We understand Russia is a symbol of the king of the south. When we come into the time of the midnight cry period, we are discussing Russia. So who is Pyrrhus representing in this time period? Vladimir Putin. Putin is the tenth leader of Russia since the time of Stalin. If you mark Stalin as the first, P 
Pune becomes the 10th. On December 31, 1999, Vladimir Putin became the Prime Minister, who was the Prime Minister of Russia, became President when Boris Yeltsin resigned. So he becomes President when the President resigns in 1999 and then in 2000 he's elected to that position. Under the Russian constitution, the president can only run for two consecutive terms. This is to prevent the establishment of a dictatorship. So Vladimir Putin, he runs for two consecutive terms, two four-year terms. Those terms end in 2008 and under the constitution, he isn't allowed to run again. So who came up and took control of Russia? His two consecutive terms ended in 2008 and as he could not run again, he named his preferred successor, Dmitry Medvedev. This was Medvedev. Two thousand and eight to two thousand and twelve. The West had thought by this time, two thousand and eight, the West had already recognized that Putin was uh, some type of dictator. They weren't sure how much control he would try to hold on to. So in when it comes to him stepping down as president, the West was on edge. They wondered, is he going to is he going to abolish the constitution and stay in power or is he going to bring one of his old KGB buddies and um, as, in, as president who will continue his thoughts? What Vladimir Putin did was very clever. He brought in a, y a young man who was pretty much a puppet ruler. Medvedev was president, Vladimir Putin was prime minister and the world recognized that they were co-ruling. Putin never properly steps down. He becomes prime minister under Medvedev. Just to even look at the poster, the, the main election poster for Medvedev, you might not be able to see, but the, the poster they put out has Medvedev standing behind Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is standing in front. Vladimir Putin is the one talking. Medvedev is listening. And in Russian on the side, it says, together we win. This was a co-rulership. One they did not go to any great uh, lengths to hide. In 2012, Medvedev did not run for a second term in office. He dutifully stepped aside and Vladimir Putin stepped back in as co-ruler, sorry, as um, only ruler. If we understand what happens to the King of the South, when is the South fully defeated? Sunday law. Can we place the number seven at Sunday law? This is the issue of the Sabbath. And then who rules that area after its final and complete fall? A league of nation states. So if Pyrrhus represents Putin, I want to trace a little bit uh, of the history of how they came into power. Pyrrhus' father was Aesides. Aesides involved his, his, involved his people in a war that was not going well for them. This was the Second Diadochi War. We discussed how Pyrrhus and Alexander the Great were related. So Alexander the Great's mother, still alive um, over those first two Diadochi Wars, was heavily involved in the breakup of her son's empire. And being a relative of Epirus, her, I, I'm not sure if it was cousin or second cousin, the king of Epirus, Pyrrhus's father, Aesides, draws Epirus into that war to defend his relative, the mother of Alexander. 
But the people of Epirus became tired of fighting. They didn't want to be involved in this war. And there is a popular uprising and he is forced to flee. So a popular uprising um, forces Aesides from the throne. This is the father of Pyrrhus. And he's removed in a coup. In this case, it's the same fellow here as there, but Neoptolemus, a rival for the throne, takes a rival family in Epirus, takes that throne. Aesides is then briefly reinstated. He comes back and takes that throne again. His people um, allow him to do that. But he's significantly weakened by this affair. So weakened that he's soon killed. Weakened and killed by um, these, these affairs. Aesides technically should not have had the throne back here. He was a younger brother. It was his elder brother that rightfully should have taken the throne of Epirus. The reason he didn't take, um, his elder brother didn't take the throne then was that he was not liked by the people. This elder brother, after the death of his younger brother Aesides, took the throne, Alcetus II. The reason Alcetus II hadn't been allowed the throne back here is because he had what is really only described as an ungovernable temper. He had a terrible temper. Essentially, he had no self-control. And the people could only tolerate for that for so long before they rose up and they put him to death. So let's go back to this history. The Soviet Union was engaged in a war they'd become tired of and could no longer continue. That was the Cold War. And that is the history of Gorbachev. The final leader of the Soviet Union. When Gorbachev, the day Gorbachev stepped down from power is the day that the Soviet Union ceased to exist. In August of 1991, he faced a military coup. The Gang of Eight, led by Yanayev, placed him under house arrest and took over government. A rival took power. This is Yanayev. Gorbachev was removed in a coup. A rival took power, took over government. Yanayev signed a decree making himself the acting president of the Soviet Union. This coup didn't last long. Shortly after, um, it fails and Gorbachev is returned to government. So Gorbachev returned. In this history, it's Cassander that comes and kills Aesides. And because of Gorbachev's, um, the, the social unrest in this time, the United States stopped looking to Gorbachev as the, as the leader and gave their approval for, uh, really approval to someone else. And who stepped up in that time and took over power was Boris Yeltsin. Gorbachev had been too significantly weakened by that affair and he's forced to step down. What was Boris Yeltsin's problem? Why did he have to step down in 1999? The problem with Boris Yeltsin was that he had no self-control. 
This is what lost him the respect of the people. If you go onto YouTube and you search for videos of Boris Yeltsin drunk, you find many. Videos of him walking off the plane to greet foreign presidents. Videos of him standing next to Bill Clinton and he can barely stand, he is so drunk. He had a major problem with alcohol. And the, the people of, of Russia, time and time again, watching their president um, embarrass them in front of world leaders, in front of all these countries, they quickly lost respect for Boris Yeltsin. It wasn't just his lack of self-control. What this brought about, this alcoholism, really brought, down a, brought about a breakdown in his health. And that was um, his excuse in the end to step down was his health. But he also knew he needed to step down. He had such a low approval rating with the people. He would have faced revolution if he didn't. So we can then see a relationship leading up to our 10th, to Pyrrhus and Putin, of a leader removed in a coup due to a war the people were tired of. A rival takes the throne for a short period of time. That leader that was removed returns but significantly weakened. And in their place, once they are forced out, killed or removed, comes in their final option, another leader who has no self-control. This then relates to health when it comes to Boris Yeltsin. And then we see the strongest, most significant leader of that country, Pyrrhus, in the history of um, Epirus and Vladimir Putin come into the history of Russia. So if Admetus, so if Pyrrhus equals Putin, who does Admetus represent? We understand Alpha and Omega end from beginning. Not only is Pyrrhus Putin, but Pyrrhus is also Admetus. So not only is Putin Pyrrhus, but Vladimir Putin is also uh, typified by Joseph Stalin. There are significant um, significant parallels between the life of Pyrrhus, sorry, the life of Putin and the life of Stalin. Prior to Putin taking power, Russia had really been led by the, who were known as the wealthy peasants. They were still the wealthy families of Russia. Gorbachev, the ones before him as they came in, they were experienced in government, trained up in government and from relatively wealthy families. Vladimir Putin was not. Neither was Joseph Stalin. Stalin was raised in poverty. His father was an alcoholic shoemaker who was also abusive and Stalin's wife uh, fled that abuse with Stalin at a young age. She worked as a laundress and moving between nine rented properties over a 10 year period to support her and her son. They grew up in extreme poverty. Vladimir Putin was raised in the slums of Leningrad. His first job was to hunt rats in the stairwells. This was a significantly um, challenging upbringing compared to what, who had led the Soviet Union or Russia before him. Stalin found purpose in that difficult life by joining the Bolshevik Revolution. He was part of the ground force during the revolution that brought about the Soviet Union. Vladimir Putin found purpose in um, his, uh, his uh, role in the KGB. He was dedicated to the KGB, the secret uh, service, services of the Soviet Union. He became a KGB agent and he was part of the ground force working um, in that role at the end of the Soviet Union. So you see ground force at the beginning of the Soviet Union, ground force at the end of the Soviet Union. He was a Bolshevik operative, Putin was a KGB operative. Both beginning, they bookend the Soviet Union. Stalin was new to politics. He didn't become part of government until the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. 
and then he is appointed to the position of General Secretary in 1922. He is appointed to that position of General Secretary by Lenin. In five years from having no experience in politics, he's given the role of General Secretary and that role of General Secretary is the only one he held for the rest of his life. All he did was make that one role of Secretary the most powerful one in the Soviet Union. He never changed or became President or anything else. He just made that role powerful. He's given that Premier role five years after he, the government begins by Lenin himself. Vladimir Putin entered local politics in 1991. He didn't enter state politics until 1996. Three years after entering state politics, he's appointed to Prime Minister later that same year as President. So you can see from state po politics in 1996, he's President in three years' time. And again, he was facing oppositions from the, the, the oligarchs, the billionaires who had swept up all the Russian resources. And it took him time to make even the position of President one of power. They worked after a similar method. Both were given their position because they made themselves appear modest, inconspicuous, grey and disciplined. The, the, the people under um, Lenin and Trotsky, those early Bolsheviks, thought that Stalin was just this quiet man they could control. They didn't understand the monster underneath that he would, was, was already. Vladimir Putin was the same. He came in as someone that Boris Yeltsin and the oligarchs thought that they could control, that he wouldn't uh, come after them and their, um, and their, what's the word, um, how they had eroded the system and um, taken the wealth. They rule in similar fashions and both form both follow whatever they need to do to stay in power. Vladimir Putin pretends to be to have a, a Christian faith, to be part of the Russian Orthodox Church. Stalin pretended to follow um, the same methodology as Lenin had placed. Neither of them really believed in that, and you can trace that history to see how they manipulate what the society expects of them to control society. Tracing these early ones, we understand that Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin led to Vladimir Putin. Gorbachev marked the end, the fall of the Soviet Union. Boris Yeltsin placed Putin in power. What about Stalin? If Putin equals Stalin, can we see that same dynamic? Gorbachev ended um, the Soviet Union when he stepped down. And when he was abdicated, when he abdicated, Tsar Nicholas ended the monarchy that had been ruling Russia for hundreds of years. In place of Tsar Nicholas, a new leader of a new state, and that was Lenin. I don't believe that Lenin had a problem with self-control, but he certainly had a problem with health. He had a series of strokes that incapacitated him. So by the time that Stalin was in the position of General Secretary, a few years after the Bolshevik Revolution, he is incapacitated due to these um, strokes. But just like Boris Yeltsin placed Putin in power, Lenin placed Stalin in power. Lenin soon learned to regret placing Stalin in power. He realised that Stalin was a monster and a dictator and he tried to have him removed. At the same way, Boris Yeltsin at the end of his life realised what he'd done in placing Putin in power. These were not grey, inconspicuous men who were going to follow um, the path that had been set out for them. They were on a path of dictatorship. Lenin recognised the dictator Stalin was and Yeltsin recognised the dictator Putin was. 
Both of them start then to cleanse um, the country of opposition. Stalin begins to kill off or prosecute or um, chase away his enemies the same way Vladimir Putin did that in the years shortly afterwards. It's no coincidence that shortly after he comes to power, a, 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 a woman journalist on his birthday is shot in an elevator down the street from uh, the, the seat of government. They knew how to give Vladimir Putin a birthday present. You kill off his enemies. In this case, a journalist, but also political opposition. Uh, any form of opposition has been uh, piece by piece um, wiped out, killed since Putin came to power. That process is still going on today. So what we learn from tracing this history of Epirus, which is a type of the King of the South, and Russia, which is the King of the South, is we see that Admetus represents Pyrrhus and from beginning. The same way Pyrrhus represents Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin, Stalin. So who else can Pyrrhus represent? Stalin. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Pyrrhus and Stalin can also um, be types of each other. The interesting thing about Stalin is he takes us back to the history when Russia, by now the Soviet Union, not at its birth, it was birthed in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution. Stalin doesn't take us back to where it was birthed at the revolution. He takes us back to where it begins to be involved in global politics. And that takes us into the history of World War II. So now what we're going to do in this line below and in the time that we have remaining is look at the history of World War II. The history of Joseph Stalin. We're going to look back to where the Soviet Union enters world politics, enters the world stage and starts making its mark and becoming involved. Stalin became ruler in 1922, but he spent those first years consolidating power. He has successfully removed his last enemy, as we've already mentioned, in 1929. It's in 1929 he puts down his last opposition. It's his 50th birthday and he begins to establish his cult of personality. 1929 is also the year the Great Depression begins with the Wall Street collapse and this Great Depression influences the rest of the world. It's particularly felt in Germany where they are having to repay, uh, make reparation payments for World War I and this um, economic decline in Germany in 1929 is what gives um, Hitler his rise to power. The people have suffered under this economic recession and they are, they are desperate. They start to become more nationalistic, more angry, and they start to um, give uh, Hitler seats in government. So you can place Stalin in 1929. You can also place Hitler in um, 1929. It's also the year where you see Mussolini take power uh, and go the Lateran Treaty with um, the papal government. So you can really place four dictatorships in 1929, the Pope, Mussolini, Hitler and Stalin in different ways. That marks a 10 year period. From the time when he consolidates power to when he first really becomes involved is 10 years. And what brings about this involvement is a proxy war. This is the history of a proxy war.
This proxy war was the Spanish Civil War. You may have heard, heard of General Franco. He was a dictator that took power at the end of that civil war that ruled Spain as a dictator, as a fascist dictator for um, decades afterwards. In the early 1930s, Stalin was deeply concerned about the spread of fascism in Europe. Vladimir Putin earlier this year described the threat that Stalin faced in his early years. Putin justified Stalin's repressions, justified Stalin killing tens of millions of people based on the idea that Stalin had an unusual um, set of circumstances, that he faced um, the challenges of rising fascism. And we know that fascism was the ideology of, of Hitler and Nazi Germany, it was the ideology of, Nation, of Mussolini, it was fascism against communism. That was the choice that Europe faced at that time. And then with the Spanish Civil War, you see it come to head. There's this clash between who is going to um, dominate Europe. Will it be fascism or communism? So you see this huge struggle building in Europe. And it is first um, challenged in this Spanish Civil War where Stalin is now concerned that if Spain becomes fascist, he's facing not only Germany and Italy, but now a, a Spain that's a, that is fascist. So this becomes a proxy war, and we discussed what a proxy war looks like when both sides arm opposing combatants. Uh, Mussolini and Hitler both aided one side of that proxy war, who they were backing was uh, General Franco. So Germany and Italy backed General Franco and the Soviet Union um, provided help to the Spanish Communist Party, the opposite side who were fighting Franco in this, in this civil war. The, they were the popular front government. The Soviet Union were the main supplies of military aid to that army. They included 1,000 aircrafts, 900 tanks, 1,500 artillery pieces, 300 armoured cars, 15,000 machine guns, 30,000 automatic firearms, 30,000 mortars, 500,000 rails and 30,000 tonnes of ammunition. This is what the Soviet Union shipped to Spain to um, aid the Republican Party in that civil war. It's said that the Spanish Civil War is, re is remembered today as a Second World War in training. This was preparation for World War II, or build up to World War II. Also, who began backing Franco's um, fascist government in that time, um, both verbally and with the action of their priests, was the Catholic Church. They also, along with Hitler and Mussolini, were backing Franco. So you see, the Catholic Church, the Vatican, the Pope take the side of fascism in Europe. And they were very open and bold about that. When Franco finally won um, in 1939, the 1st of April 1939, Pius XII, Hitler's Pope, stated that God should be thanked for once more the hand of divine providence has manifested itself over Spain. They were praising God for Franco's victory, keeping in mind that while the other side had also killed tens of thousands of people, Franco had killed, slaughtered, essentially genocide, um, tens of thousands of people in this civil war. The Soviet Union shipped so much to Spain in the Civil War. They expected Spain to pay for it and Spain ended up having to ship to the Soviet Union $500 million worth of gold. Two thirds of Spain's gold reserves were shipped to the Soviet Union over the course of that Civil War. And that proxy war ends on the 1st of April 1939 with the victory of Franco who was fascist. So you have two opposing parties. One is 
uh, fascist, one is communist. Hitler and Stalin on the opposite side of different ideologies, really um, born enemies. So the world is taken by surprise when just a few months later, on the 23rd of August, they go into an alliance. This was the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. It's named after the two men. This um, Ribbentrop was the foreign minister of Germany, Molotov the foreign minister of, of the Soviet Union. They came together to sign this pact. It was an alliance between the Soviet Union and Germany. This was signed on the 23rd of August 1939. There were two parts to this pact, both open and secret. One was a non-aggression pact. So what Stalin said to, said to Hitler is if you go to war, I won't also go to war with you because Germany is in an awkward position. It's right in the middle of Europe. Hitler down here wants to invade Poland. But if he invades Poland, he knows that um, England, Britain, and France will declare war. Because these three are allies. And if he invades Poland, he knows that he's not just going to war with Poland, he's going to war with the three allied forces. He wants Poland. So if he is willing to engage with this war, then he's going to have a war on the Western Front. But his ideological enemy, who has just fought in a proxy war, is the Soviet Union. And what Hitler is afraid of is that if he goes to war with the West, he will be so weakened on this side that the Soviet Union will engage him on a war in the east and now Germany in the middle and vulnerable will have a war on two fronts and this is how the first world war played out Germany had a war on two fronts and it was too much for them it stretched them too far so what Hitler wants to prevent is a war on two fronts if he goes into a treaty makes peace with Stalin then he can win against the West and then come and take the East he always planned to defeat the Soviet Union. He just needed time. He couldn't win a war if he began it uh, on both fronts at the same time. So this drives Hitler to declare, to, to go into a treaty with the Soviet Union. But what did Stalin get, get from this treaty? What was he able to get from um, allowing Hitler to engage war with the West. For Stalin, he had a different plan in mind. He's not particularly fond of any of them. And if Germany goes to war with the West, then all of these still for him enemies will tire each other out. The longer he can make this war in the West go on, the weaker each power will be. Germany will be weaker, their men will be dying, they'll be running through ammunition, England will be weaker, France will be weaker, their cities will be bombed. And if there's war with the West and he can sit back and watch his enemies fight, then when they're so weak and he can step in um, and he will be the strongest of all of them, he can take everything. So Stalin was quite happy to help Hitler go to war with the West. So neither of them are friends in this history, but both of them um, are benefited by, ben benefited by this pact. So the first part of it was a 10-year non-aggression pact, that if Hitler went to war with these, Stalin would step back and not um, declare war on Germany. Then there was a secret part of this pact. The secret part was that they would then carve up Eastern Europe between them. The territory that lied between Germany and the Soviet Union would be split and they pretty much redrew the map of Eastern Europe. You have this, this is mine. You have this, this is mine. A 
a book by Timothy Snyder, Stalin in Europe, Im Im Imitation and Domination. It says a 10-year non-aggression pact signed sometime after midnight. They met around midnight to negotiate it. It signed just after midnight. Included in the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact was a secret protocol by which Poland, Romania and the Baltic states would be divided into German and Soviet spheres of influence. Each power was free to seize its share without facing repercussions from the other. Thus, ideological enemies became political and military allies. Hitler no longer had to fear a prolonged two-front war. The two forces of socialism and Soviet Bolshevism, so fascism versus communism, now came together. Viktor Sergei, a Russian revolutionary writer, would assert the midnight of the century arrived. This is the midnight of the century. began. 1st of September 1939. Three Allied forces. Poland, England and France were facing off against a Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, who's now backed by the Soviet Union. satellite states. If the only reason that the Soviet Union had control over the satellite states was that Hitler had let them, that's not a very good reason. Hitler's no longer very popular, you may have noticed. So they would never admit to this deal with Hitler being the reason that they took those states. They finally were forced to admit to it in 1989. And who admitted to it was Alexander Yakovlev a senior member of the government of the Soviet Union. And he said that although he dismissed the nationalistic claims of the Baltic states, that there was without doubt a collusion between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. So what is this? Collusion between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, between Stalin and Hitler. The effect of this pact on the world stage. Once the world heard that this pact was signed, they knew without a doubt that Hitler was going to invade Poland and initiate war with the West. They knew that they were facing a second world war. I'll read to you from a book, The Devil's Alliance, Hitler's Pact with Stalin. 
It says the week preceding those opening salvos, the opening shots of World War II had an oppressive note. Although the precise details of the pact remained opaque, most con contemporary commentators agreed that it marked an unprecedented shift. The whole course of world politics suddenly changed when this pact was signed. Moreover, there was a grim consensus that the pact was more than just another chapter in Europe's ongoing crisis, and this was herald going to herald war. Franklin D. Roosevelt, the pres American president at the time, sent Hitler a personal appeal begging for alternative methods to solving this crisis, something other than war. The French Premier Daladier followed suit, urging the German dictator Hitler to step back from the brink of war. Otherwise, he said, destruction and barbarism will be the real victors. The British Prime Minister Chamberlain, meanwhile, was inconsolable. He confided to the US Ambassador that what was frightful was that it was all futile. He knew it couldn't be stopped. Britain immediately began preparing for war. London's museums began evacuating their treasures to the countryside. Hospitals were cleared of all but essential cases. Railway stations installed blue lights to comply with expected blackouts. Sandbags were filled and stacked. Windows were taped down. Chamberlain moved to the central war room beneath Whitehall and orders were prepared for the evacuation of children from the towns and cities um, into the countryside. So this is the response the world had to the pact being signed. They knew that they were about to end, enter another world war. When the, while the world was digesting the news of the Nazi-Soviet pact and considering um, what that implied, Ribbentrop, the foreign minister for Germany, returned back to Germany from, Russia, from the Soviet Union to a rapturous reception from Hitler who hailed his returning foreign minister as a second Bismarck. So one of the reasons for Germany to go into an alliance with the Soviet Union was to prevent a war on two fronts, so it could go to war with the West, but there was also an economic reason. Germany uh, could only supply a sh uh, only a little bit of its needs to engage a war effort. It didn't have enough oil, it didn't have enough uh, of the different metals, rubber, all of those things. They all needed to be imported and they either were needed to come from the Soviet Union or from rail lines from the east that went through Soviet territory. So to even fund his war effort he had to have an alliance with Stalin. There's a book called Feeding the German Eagle that gives much more information on that. Without Soviet imports, German stocks would have run out in several key products by October of 1941, only three and a half months into their war with the Soviet Union. So, so the Soviet Union actually enabled Germany to attack it. A lot of what Germany used to attack the Soviet Union when it finally did invade was the resources that originally came from the Soviet Union itself. So there was also this economic need. And then we discussed the invasion of Poland, the beginning of World War II. Shortly after Germany in, um, invaded Poland, England and France declared war. At the same time as this, the, the Vatican is involved. They've already helped, um, start to help Hitler rise to power, and now they are, um, and now they're also working with within the United States. What they're wanting to do is turn the United States from seeing Germany as the the enemy to seeing the Soviet Union as the enemy. They're still hoping the United States will um, see the Soviet Union as a threat and engage the Soviet Union instead of joining the Allies against Germany. But this is really where that beast fails to comply. That the United States was not an effective beast for World War II and you find that uh, in the statement that Re President Roosevelt sent to Pope Pius the, tw the, the 12th a couple of days after the invasion of Poland. Roosevelt said to the Pope, 
I believe that the survival of Russia is less dangerous to religion, to the church as such and to humanity in general than would be the survival of the German form of dictatorship. So what the United States disagreed with was who the enemy was. For the Vatican, the Soviet Union, the King of the South is the enemy and Germany is doing okay. For the United States, Germany is the enemy. They would rather see the Soviet Union survive. So this, they divide up spheres of influence, Eastern Europe, and then you see in shortly after in 1940, the year following in 1940, in the month of August, this new alliance relationship is first strained. And this is due to conflicts over dividing up territory. They've run into some um, where they didn't divide the, the Eastern Europe very neatly and they both want different parts. They start to um, fight over those parts and there's also the problem that the Soviet Union is sending all these imports into Germany to fund the war effort and Germany isn't paying, they're meant to be paying. So there's a couple of reasons why this uh, relationship begins to break down. And as we discussed, Germany could not fight war on the west or on the east without Soviet imports. And in the month of August 1940, Soviet Union cuts off their supply. They will send no more imports into Germany. For a whole month, Germany is receiving um, none of their imports. This lasts for one month. Russia suspended trade until they were able to ne renegotiate. They rewrote those trade agreements uh, in a way that was quite favourable to Russia, so, sorry, quite favourable to Germany, and they also um, sorted out their problems about the, this division. The other reason that Stalin suspended trade to Germany was the fact that Germany was doing quite well in World War II at that stage. They'd taken over France, they, they were just doing well, and Stalin was afraid that Hitler would win too easily and he would become too great a power. But by the end of August, Germany isn't doing so well in the war and Stalin is again content that they'll keep fighting for a while yet. But Hitler becomes tired of being dependent on imports from the Soviet Union and he decides it would be easier if he just hurried up his original plan to take, um, to take that territory anyway. And you don't need imports if you own it. So on the 22nd of June, 1941, Hitler invades the Soviet Union. This was Operation Barbarossa, known as Operation Redbeard. Barbarossa means red beard. And this is where Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, breaking their pact. Both sides knew that war was coming, but Stalin thought he had more time. Hitler had always said prior to this history in World War II, prior to all of this history, in his um, autobiography Mein Kampf, he had said that the East was the living space for his new super race. So he'd always believed that what Germany needed wasn't the West, but the East. And he said, he actually said to, um, he said to the League of Nations, the commissioner for the League of Nations that existed at that time, Karl Burkhard, he said, Hitler said, everything I undertake is directed against Russia. If the West is too stupid and blind to grasp this, then I shall be compelled to come to an agreement with the Russians, the Molotov Pact, defeat the West, and then after their defeat, turn against the Soviet Union with all my forces. I need the Ukraine so that they can't starve us out, as happened in World War I. So Hitler made it clear that he just needed the West suppressed so he could then concentrate all his forces on an eastern front and take what he saw as um, the living space for his new race. Part of the reason he wanted to wipe out the Russians as he did was that he 
had the exact same thinking as the Vatican did. Both sides believed that the Bolsheviks were either Jewish or driven by the Jews, so that communism was a Jewish ideology. And this is where Hitler and the Vatican both blamed the Jews for communism, the French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution. And this is one of the reason, uh, reasons for the Holocaust and his, um, that terrible persecution. In this history, in 1941, you will also see gas chambers come into operation. If Hitler is going to fund a two-front war, he needs to not have his men running concentration camps. He doesn't have enough soldiers to be running those camps. So what before was concentration camps and masses of people now really steps into, I suppose, more of what we envision the Holocaust, just the complete destruction of hundreds of thousands and millions of people. Now they're not just keeping them for a time, now it's just total slaughter. And this really was part of the, um, of the, one of the, one of the effects of a two-front war. This attack caused the Soviet Union to join the Allied forces. Mm. Now, finally, the Soviet Union is on the same is facing the same enemy as the Allies. So as you would expect, they join forces. The USSR joins the Allied forces and then America enters the war and it's the others involved but largely the United States marching from the west and Stalin marching from the east that from these two fronts invade uh, Germany. And Nazi Germany was defeated. by the USA, USA plus the USSR and it is divided that whole territory into east and west. This is the office of the historian, the Bureau of Public Affairs for the US Department of State, May 2005. It says Soviet forces from the east and Allied forces from the west continued to advance on Germany. After a fierce and costly battle, Berlin fell to Soviet forces on May 8 of 1945. After Allied and Soviet troops had met on the Elbe River to shake hands and congratulate each other on a hard-won imp impending victory. So Soviet forces from the east and Allied forces from the west meet on the Elbe River and the Elbe River runs through Germany. It's divided. Three superpowers by now, USA, France and Britain, had united with the USSR to fight against Germany. But as we all know, this didn't settle the question of what would happen to these eastern states. This divided it into east and west. And that created a new type of war. A Cold War. Those two powers that had divided it into East and West now wanted all of it. At the end of, of World War II, the Soviet Union and the United States emerged as the two world superpowers and a period of tensions began between the Soviet-backed Eastern Bloc and the US-backed Western Bloc known as the Cold War. In 1948, the United States began a campaign of economic sanctions against the Soviet Union that would last more than 50 years. So from the United States, you see sanctions and also the Solidarity Movement subterfuge. They were undermining the authority of um, communism of the Soviet Union within those Eastern Bloc countries. Time magazine describes um, the, what 
the United States was using against the USSR, financial aid, covert operations, economic isolation, and using things like the use of Radio Liberty, Voice of America, transmitting um, messages from the West into Eastern Europe. And that was what brought about the end of the Cold War when the USSR fell. So, nineteen eighty nine, when it fell. So what happened in 1989? I'd like to suggest, yes, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Did the Soviet Union end in 1989? No. I want to, for reasons that we're going to discuss later, mark this two year period, 1989 to 1991, because this was a process of time, it was a two year process. And while you see the end of one type of war, much of the world, this movement up until a few years ago, believed that this war was over, that the job was done, that the South had been defeated, the King of the South. But I would suggest that it didn't end. All it did was change in scene, change in appearance. And I would suggest that is what the history of Pyrrhus teaches us, that it comes in two parts. First of all, Macedonia. There's a first att attempt to take down the King of the South. But then we see a change in scene. The war continues, but it's different now. So in 1989 and up to 1991, you see the fall of the King of the South. Pyrrhus lost all but Epirus. And really all fell but Russia. The King of the South lost all of his empire except for the borders of Russia itself. That's the Alpha history. What we want to chart when we come back tonight is the Omega history. That this war didn't end but it changed in appearance because at the same time this happened something else happened. Gorbachev never planned for, for the Soviet Union to fall. What he just hoped was that he would be able to rehabilitate it and make it more friendly. But you see in this history that that wasn't enough for those satellite states. And one country in particular changed its allegiance to from the Soviet Union to the West. All of those countries did. What I want to mark is those satellite states appeal to the West. They are no longer under the sphere of influence of Russia, now they come under the sphere of influence of the West. And we're going to particularly consider Ukraine in that history. They don't actually change their allegiance in the 1989. The Soviet Union crumbles marking that appeal in 1991. Their alliance changes in 1991 and we can't ignore that either. We're going to finish off this history uh, when we come back together tonight, if you'll kneel with me in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for all of our blessings. Thank you for your histories, that you give us uh, a knowledge of what is happening around us. We know, Lord, that without knowledge there can be such fear and that we have nothing to fear for the future except knowing uh, how you have worked in the past and understanding these past histories can give us courage, Lord, that you are in control, that even through the work of the counterfeit, and the satanic Lord, you make sure that we, we can understand what is happening now, that World War II can teach us, Lord, and we can not be ignorant of what is occurring in politics and in the world around us. 
Thank you, Lord, for your love and for your faithfulness to us. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with us as we go about the rest of our day and continue, Lord, to work in this camp. We know, Lord, that Satan hates it when brethren come together and meet like this, Lord, that he's on the ground. But, Lord, you're raising up a mighty and a strong army. And I pray, Lord, that you will continue to equip us in mind and in heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.